Thanks. These handouts today actually are extended version from two weeks ago. So if you held on to yours, you get extra points, but you might miss some things. Yeah. In addition to that, uh, lesson seven, so last week was six, worship seven this week, um, is the Marks of the Church. Now that's abbreviated, because I don't know that we'll have time, but um, many of you may have heard of the Marks, three Marks of the Church. We'll discuss some of that. It will not be nearly as lengthy as the previous. So let me just give you a couple recommendations. And then is seven on that back chair? Awesome. While Dee's handing those out, so this is the book that uh, one of the resources, primary resources that Pastor Berge and I have been working through. It's called uh, The Church, Contours of Christian Theology. It's a series. There's about six books. Uh, the Holy Spirit, um, the church, the atonement, it just covers several topics in, in depth for your pleasure. Hey, since you guys talked about worship last week, it's a great film right here. We may watch this in a few months at our church. It's called Spirit and Truth. My names are on the credits in the back because I contributed to the... I always like to say that. That's my one, that's my one famous... Not Stephanie, though. She always gets upset with me. Yeah, you can yeah. You know, there's also about a hundred other names who contributed to making this film. But, uh, very good. It's documentary on reform worship. It's got a bunch of big names. Kevin DeYoung, I see Robert Godfrey on the back. Uh, Kevin DeYoung. All, it's just really good. Um, you won't go to sleep during that one. And then a couple more, just quickly. Uh, this is a better way. I may have recommended this before, but um, it's by Michael Horton, Rediscovering the Drama of Christ-Centered Worship. And this is not just about worship. If you, if you want to understand the church, particularly the Reformed view, not just of worship, but just the Reformed church, this book was pivotal, pivotal for me uh, about 10 years ago. It's excellent, excellent. I can't recommend that enough. And this is a book I always give to guys uh, and gals who are um, coming into the Reformed Church, particularly when it comes to the sacraments. We'll deal with some of that today, but not in depth. We've talked about the sacraments a lot. Uh, it's called Christ's Baptism and the Lord's Supper by Leonard J. Vanderzee. He's a uh, Reformed pastor. This book won an award. Uh, I think it was, it was 2008 or so. Um, rediscovering the Sacraments for Evangelical Worship. Also excellent for the church. I mean, this is a go-to for me. Okay. Let's pray, and we'll jump, jump right in. Uh, Father, we ask that uh, during this time that you would quiet our hearts and minds, uh, give us clarity and focus as we study and worship you um, through our own reflection on your church. Christ's bride to us, as us. And so, uh, please just open your word to us, God. Um, speak through any inadequacies and, and help us to um, catch a larger grasp, a greater grasp of um, the body that you've redeemed. We pray all of this in your Son's name. Amen. Okay, so if you have Lesson 5... Um, we got through the five fundamentals of the faith, and that was where we, uh, where we were. It should be on there. And I give you sort of an abbreviated outline um, compared to what I have, but uh, it should kind of keep us on track. So, in terms of um, the church Catholic... We had talked about division and how that kind of plays out in uh, denominationalism. And after Paul tries to quell divisions in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, he immediately appeals to the gospel as he so often does. He gives often indicatives and imperatives 
the imperative is to be unified. Uh, the indicative is the gospel. Right? Here's why. We can gather around the gospel, and that's why we tackled a few of the fundamentals, because you, in the gospel, you need all those fundamentals. Um, Paul also says, when it comes to that particular passage, 1 Corinthians 1, that he didn't come with eloquent speech. He didn't bring secret knowledge. Uh, if you've read any church history like the Gnostics, they were always saying, we've got this great thing, but you can't see it yet. You can't see it yet. I've got it. You can't have it. Maybe you can have it if you do what we tell you to do. Uh, he didn't charge. He didn't hide. He didn't charge a fee. Uh, but he actually presented himself, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, to the church as one who is um, full of fear and trembling. And that's, that's important because in the first part of 1 Corinthians, the division is following a particular person. So, some were baptized by Apollos, some uh, followed um, Paul, some Paul followed Cephas, Peter, some followed Christ. And so there's kind of this divvying up. And, and we have, I mean, we do. We, have, we love our Christian celebrities, but particularly in America, right? So, you know, when someone says, R.C. Sproul, wow, see? Thank you. <laughs> Amen, right? Well, <laughs> that's a movie. I just, I just gave like 50 bucks. <laughs> so, um, so there's always a temptation. I mean, our, it's funny to, to hear all of the testimonies in our inquirers class and how many people have said, well, I started listening to this guy on the radio, or way back when, I started listening to his tapes, right? And, or, our, you know, like me, I just, I read one of his books. Somebody gave me a book, and I was like, they've been hiding this stuff from me. So, um, but there is a temptation based on celebrity or people, uh, but Paul just kind of crushes all that. Uh, and he, again, he points back to the gospel, which is the whole, the whole of what we can gather around uh, as the church. And we'll get more into that when we talk about the marks of the church. In addition, number two for lesson five is that the church is holy. Now, throughout Christian history, many have tried to pursue holiness. I mean, there's books been, that have been written, The Pursuit of Holiness, famous one. Uh, in the fifth century, there's this kind of interesting eccentric character. His name was Simeon the Stylite. Anybody ever heard of this guy? He was one of those spiritual... Um, I don't know if you call him gurus. He was a monk in Syria. And he spends 37 years living on a platform 50 feet above the earth. And so there were all t kinds of, of people that emerged early on pursuing holiness in the church. Um, he was trying to get away from the earth, literally, right? The world, literally, by living on this platform. But here's the interesting thing about that. When you're living on a platform 50 feet up, and it wasn't big, what, I mean, you still got to eat, right? He still needed the church. And so he would drop a little basket down, and the church would come and bring him his stuff to read and his food um, and all the necessities. So when, when we talk about holiness, we, we need to think in terms of um, the church collective, right? N not just individuals. We, we can't escape um, the church because Christ is coming back for his church. In, the, uh, in Isaiah 6, if you've read Isaiah, the prophet has a vision of the Lord sitting on his throne, and what does he do? He cries out, holy, 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 and then he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. Um, and it, and I, the prophet says that the foundations and the thresholds of the earth shook. So, you know, when it comes to the church, and when we look at the church, when we look throughout Christian history, the church hasn't always presented as holy. Clearly, um, when you look around, turn on your, you know, CBN or uh, any Christian station, it, the church doesn't present as holy. So the question I think for us is, how is the church holy? How is the church holy? Um, throughout the Old Testament, uh, the people of God, they displayed holiness through their uh, symbolic 
uh, sacrifices. And what happens in, when Jesus shows up on the scene in, in the first century in the Gospels is that that holiness has turned to pride and they've wrapped everything they have, as we'll see in Galatians in two weeks, everything they have in these markers of holiness. But that's not holiness. That's not holiness. Um, but Peter commands us to be holy. First Peter, or Peter 1, he says this, this is 14-16, through 16, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as He who called you is holy, you also be holy. That's an imperative in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy as I am holy. So God commands holiness of us. Um, he commands holiness, but... Throughout the New Testament, you see that the church, again, is dealing with pride, strife, sexual morality, abuse. You don't need to watch a soap opera. Just read 1 Corinthians. Just read 1 Corinthians. Uh, it, it reads like a soap opera. But Paul and Peter still address the church as saints. And the, the literal meaning of saints in the Greek is holy ones. He calls them holy. So... How do we reconcile the church as being holy despite all of the issues and all the problems? Well, there's about three different ways that some of the church scholars have, have tried to reconcile this over the forever. One is this. Um, this is one Catholic view, that the church, Roman Catholic view, that the church is separate from the saints so that those who are venerated um, those who are saints recognized by the church are holy. And then you have the sinners in the church, you know, us, the peasants. Uh, the second way that, that's, that many have tried to reconcile the holiness of the church is that it's, the church is described as holy even though its members are sinners. This is um, what I call, uh, it doesn't mean what it says it means. You know, it's like, uh, it says this, but that's no, not really what it means. Uh, the third way that some in the church have tried to distinguish is uh, they distinguish between the holy and sinful parts of Christ, a Christian individual Christian himself, like the better half or the worse half. Uh, but I don't think any of these really are helpful. And what is helpful is what we often go back to, what we continue to go back to, is justification. That the holiness of the church really finds its root in justification. And justification is that we have been declared righteous before God. And so we don't have infused righteousness, but when God sees us, He sees us as holy because of Christ. United to Christ, His holiness, that's how He can legitimately and honestly declare us holy, because we are united to Christ. So He, Im he imputes righteousness on our account, and therefore we've been credited with righteousness and holiness, and we can be called saints. We can be called the holy ones as the church. We can be called holy. Um, there's you know, been some debate in our denomination recently about identifying, identification, continual debate. would appreciate your prayers next week. But in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul addresses this when he's talking about all the sins of the New Testament he says, um, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexual immoral, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, thieves. You've heard it. He lists all these. And then, of course, he says, and such were some of you. Right? There's a delineation. There's a distinction. We don't identify in those ways because we are holy. We are the holy ones of God who have been united to Christ in his perfection. John Owen says this, that holiness is nothing but the implanting, writing, and realizing of the gospel in our souls. What Christ seeks in his church is what the gospel provides or promises and provides as the Spirit. He sees us as holy in our justification before Christ, because of Christ, who is holy. Because Christ is the head of the body. Remember? Christ is the head of the body. So we are attached to Him. So we can live out holiness in our sanctification until complete wholeness and holiness in our glorification. 
So the gospel affirms the holiness of the church in Christ and therefore calls us to be holy because we are holy. We are considered holy. Number three, the apostolic church. This gets interesting. We, this is not really a study on um, church polity or church government, uh, but we're going to have to address a few things here when it comes to what does it mean to be apostolic. And I may mess that word up because there's a lot of O's uh, in that word, but bear with me. So I think a, two or three weeks ago, Pastor Berge, maybe four weeks ago, discussed uh, the, in Matthew how... Peter is come, Jesus comes to Peter and he says, you know, he asks him, who do you say I am? And then he says, uh, Peter, uh, and, Jesus, and he says, well, you're the Messiah. And, Peter, and then Jesus tells Peter, well, um, you, are the, you shall be called the rock. And upon this rock, I'll build my church. Um, the use, it, it, he gives him the keys of the kingdom there. The use of the keys is not limited to the twelve, but this authority that's presented to Peter uh, is an authority possessed by the church. So when we talk about being apostolic, there's a carryover, not in the office, not in, not in the actual being an apostle, uh, but there is a carryover of, of some authority, not, not complete authority. So let's look at that. The foundation of God's house that's built on the teaching of the apostles does not run indefinitely like a roadbed, but it is laid once and for all. So if you look at uh, Ephesians 2.20, um, he'll articulate that, Paul will articulate that there. The church is apostolic because it is built on the apostolic foundation. And the apostles' task was to build on the foundation laid by Christ himself. Their message was confirmed by signs and wonders. This is how, one of the marks of an apostle. Um, also, one of the, I, I think one of the reasons the charismatic church, there's so much focus. You'll see the title of apostle given to people. I, certainly, I would agree, disagree with that. I think many of us would. Um, but the, at least they recognize that there needs to be signs and wonders verifying apostleship. So Paul teaches that the New Testament apostles and prophets are the foundation of the church because they receive the revelation. It's not just about them, it's about their message. It's about them actually receiving divine revelation from God. In Ephesians 3, 5, Paul says, what was not made known in other generations has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. Of course, the prophets being the Old Testament. The function of the apostles was unique and unrepeatable. And the question for us, I think, is how? How is it unique and unrepeatable? Well, they received the revelation of God. We've said that, um, which was the meaning and the message for the church. They had also witnessed the historic reality of the death and resurrection of Christ. And if some would say, well, what about Paul? I mean, well, Paul sees... Christ, he appears to him in the clouds, right? Of course, there's some, you know, we don't know if Paul wasn't at the crucifixion either. The odds are he probably was at the crucifixion, actually, as an enemy of God, uh, because he was one of the foremost persecutors of Christians um, or followers of Jesus. But he was also, um, he had high authority in, in the uh, Sanhedrin, so... He may have witnessed the, the crucifixion, but we know that he witnesses the very clear visual resurrected Christ, which is a mark of an apostle, a requirement of, the, of an apostleship. Uh, the church is apostolic because it is, a found, it is founded on apostolic teaching and also because of its charge to carry out the Great Commission. Now, we would be remiss if we don't tackle what's called apostolic succession. Have you heard of apostolic succession? If you have maybe a Catholic background or, um, or even an Anglican or Episcopalian background, you might have heard of this apostolic succession. The Mormons also. Okay. Do they really? Okay. Wow. Through the lost tribes. Um, 
In Matthew 16, well, we, we've talked about that. Um, when it comes to Peter, this is why we address Peter, because the Roman Catholic Church has used Matthew 16 to say that Peter was the first pope and that the church began with Peter. But the Reformers understood this as Peter being a foundation stone, but really as his faith, as his revelation from God to know who Jesus was as the foundation of the church. So Jesus could have said, Peter, um, upon you I build this church, but he says upon this rock. And it's in the context of Peter recognizing who Jesus is and verbally articulating who Jesus is. So the question is, why is this important? Well, it's important for church polity. Um, if you read through the book of Acts, you see multiple um, narratives of what's going on in the early church with the um, elders and deacons and how they come about. Um, if you, you know, you're at a Presbyterian church, that just Presbytery, Presbyterianism comes from the Greek word presbyteros, it just means elder. Uh, if you've gone to an Episcopal church, uh, that would come from the word episkopos, which means bishop. But those two are really... Um, they're really used interchangeably, particularly in Acts. So what's the difference between elder and bishop? We need to know this. Um, in Acts 20, the words are used synonymously. So Acts 20.17 says, um, Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders, the presbyteros of the church, to come to him. And when he came to them, he said this. In Acts 20.28 which just a few verses down, he uses uh, the word episkopos, and he's using it interchangeably. So by the term apostolic succession, the Roman Catholic Church has asserted that its bishops have an uninterrupted and continuous line of succession from the apostles and Peter to the bishops today. That's paragraph 77 of the Catholic Catechism. You can come read it in my office if you'd like. It also says in there that it is for bishops as the successor of the apostles to hand down the gift of the Spirit, the apostolic line. So in close connection with the idea of apostolic succession is the transmission of the tradition. And here's where the rubber meets the road for us when it comes to what does it mean that the church is apostolic. Because for the Roman Catholic Church, for a church to be apostolic, it means that there is there is a tradition outside of Scripture, sometimes overlapping, but outside of Scripture that must be carried down through the succession of bishops all the way from Peter to us. Uh, this is problematic. Uh, for one, it's problematic because it's led to, you know, not just the papacy, but the mass, um, purgatory, indulgences, immaculate conception, assumption of Mary, papal infallibility, um, in terms of ex cathedra, all these things have been passed down in this tradition, this succession, through the laying on of hands from the bishops. Um, for the Roman Catholic Church, apostolic succession of bishops perpetuates and guarantees both the faithful teaching of Scripture and this tradition in the Roman Church. But what we know from Scripture is that there is, there is no unwritten tradition. So when you look at the back of our bulletin, people have asked me about this, and it says where truth and tradition meet at the cross, um, the reference to this, the way I see it, is, is really about liturgy. We have a traditional liturgy, right? But none of that, none of that, um, in any way supersedes or comes close to Scripture or the elements of worship for us. So we, we have an ordered worship, we have a traditional liturgy, um, and that's, that's been formulated throughout the church, but that does not mean that anything outside of Scripture, anything, comes even close to the same authority. The Protestants, on the other hand, have this idea of what's called um, apostolicity, Apostolicity. <laughs> uh, this is defined as receiving and obeying 
apostolic doctrine as it's set forth in the New Testament. So apostolic succession that's carried down through the, through the tradition, or through the, the bishops, the traditions of the Roman church, and the reformers come along and they say, no, 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 no. Apostolicity is the focus on the doctrine contained and set forth in the New Testament. Now, Protestants permit no ultimate appeal to traditions that are distinct from sacred Scripture. Uh, West, I think I've given it to you. Westminster Confession 1.10 says that the supreme judge by which all controversies of religion are to be determined, all decrees of councils, opinions of ancient writers, doctrines of men, and private spirits, that usually is, that's usually interpreted as personal opinions, by the way, are to be examined and in whose sentence we are to rest can be no other but the Holy Spirit speaking in Scripture. In Scripture is the key there. The theory behind the Roman Catholic belief in apostolic succession is that God's authority in order to be meaningful and effective must be embodied in men today who have the same kind of authority. But when it comes to apostolicity, the authority remains in the Word of God. He has spoken he has carried men along, and He has given us His special revelation. You can find that in multiple verses. I mean, I can just give you a few. 1 Corinthians 15, 8, um, when Paul is speaking of, he says, The last of all, He was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. Um, Paul continues to speak about himself as the last apostle. The signs of a true apostle in 2 Corinthians 12 were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders. The apostles died out. They, they were no more um, after the first century. Probably late, late first century with John. In regard to church discipline in 1 Corinthians 5, 4-5, through 5, Paul does not need to be present with the church at Corinth as an apostle. What does he do? He simply tells them to follow his teaching and therefore they would be with him in spirit. He doesn't even have to be there. He says, follow my teaching. You don't need me. You need the Holy Spirit. But I'm with you in spirit as you listen to the gospel or the direction of the apostles who've been given revelation. The apostles established the church by preaching the scriptures in their fulfillment. Um, the fellowship in the book of Acts ex exists among those who continue in the apostolic teaching. That's Acts 2, 42. The growth of the church in the, in the first century is described by Luke as the growth of the Word of God. So you see the emphasis, the focus, the ministries by which the church is built are ministries of the Word of God. Ephesians 4, 11. The apostolicity of the church is built on the foundation of the apostolic gospel. This is why you hear gospel a lot. The message, the proclamation. We gather around the Word of God. And this, to be apostolic for the church, means that we are built on the doctrine of the apostles, handed down by God. Not the chair or the place of Peter, but the teaching and the understanding of Peter. There's a, several references to, to this, even from early church fathers. For example, Ignatius, who was the bishop of Antioch, which we would say an elder, the elder of Antioch. He was also a disciple of the Apostle John, by the way, martyred early 2nd century. He says repeatedly that he did not have the authority of the apostles. If anybody would have had the authority or of apostleship, it would have been the direct mentee of the Apostle John. Who becomes a bishop? Who becomes a bishop in Antioch? One of the bishop, Antioch and Alexandria become the hubs of Christianity um, of some of their early church fathers. The New Testament contains no record that the apostles appointed men to succeed them as apostles, but rather that they established a church order consisting of what? Elders and deacons. Elders and deacons. 1 Timothy 3, Titus. Clement, who was another guy, and he was bishop of Rome, first, late first century after they killed the other ones, um, he, he also confirms this. Okay, so that ends 
our, um, that ends our first section. Questions, comments? Mr. Fred. Okay, so impu yes, sir. Yeah, imputation is just on account of, right? I impute something, I just credit your account. Infusion is put into you. So righteousness put in. Catholic view is that righteousness is infused into a person. That uh, baptism washes away original sin. Um, of course, you know, it's not, I don't think it's biblical, but regardless. And then, so imputation is it's imputed on our account. I'm sorry? Yeah, I mean, the proclamation of, yeah, what's, what's happened, yeah. Any others? All right, all right, part two, here we go. Lesson number seven, the marks of the church. Marks of the church. Now, if you followed social media re recently, you've noticed uh, that the Soviet Republic of Canada has been arresting some uh, pastors. And if you watch one of those videos one or two weeks ago, some of you guys posted on Facebook, um, one of the officers decided to have a theological discussion on camera. I thought that was a mistake with a pastor, a Reformed Baptist pastor. And he said, and this, you know, the reason he was being arrested is because they had church. You, know, you probably know the backstory of some of this, right? They had church and... Um, uh, the Canadian government won't let them, whatever province they're in. And so the officer says, well, where two or three are gathered, that is church. And his implication was, just, just get your family and, and have church, right? And uh, it, to his credit and grace, the pastor said, well, I'd be happy to have a discussion with you over Matthew 18 right now, um, which would have been fascinating on camera as he was in handcuffs. But that, that kind of, in, in Matthew 18, is misused all the time for describing church. By the way, that's church discipline. So two or three is about witnesses and God validating those witnesses. But that leads us to what is a church? Like, what constitutes a church? What are the marks given for a church? So let's look at some marks. Now, Calvin gives two uh, but implicit in one of them is sort of the third one. Um, but, again, the great mark of the church is the gospel. Everything flows out of the preached word of the gospel. So all the other stuff's wrapped up in this. It's the hub. The gospel of salvation for sinners because of the cross, resurrection of Christ. Um, why do we ask this question? What is the church? Well, for many reasons. One is because we are Reformed, and so the question for Protestants is how do you maintain the unity of the church apart from the Pope, apart from this king, the vicar of Christ, um, who supposedly bounds the church together around him? So the Reformed church had some answers, and... First of all, they affirm the historic creeds, right? Nicene, Apostles' Creed, Athanasius, they affirm the historic creeds, and also the first four councils. Most Protestant churches affirm the first four councils, church councils. But the Reformation, in answering these questions of, well, how, how do you know that you are a church, made the gospel, not ecclesiastical, that's church, organization, the test of the true church. And in the Belgic Confession, which is from our Dutch, or from our, we usually call continental reformed, um, wouldn't be Dutch, because it's Belgic. The Belgic Confession, Article 29, Paragraph 3, I think I've given that to you, explicitly gives us the marks of the church. We'll walk through some of those. It says, the marks by which the true church is known are these. 
Oh, let's have somebody read it. I've talked a lot. Miss Barbara Ann, you're my go-to. Will you read this for us really loud? Real loud? Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> All righty. <clears throat> the marks by which the true church is known are these. If the pure doctrine of the gospel is preached therein, if it maintains the pure administration of the sacraments as instituted by Christ, if church discipline is exercised in chastening of sin, in short, if all things are managed according to the pure word of God, all things contrary thereto rejected, and Jesus Christ acknowledged as the only head of the church, hereby the true church may certainly be known, from which no man has a right to separate himself. Thank you. What does this mean? What does this mean? It means that there are churches and there are not churches. There are churches and there are not churches. I'll give you an example. Um, we, and we discussed this years ago. Uh, we support the Salvation Army. We like the Salvation Army. They do some great things in the community. Um, I would encourage participation with the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army is not a church. They may claim to be a church. They're not a church. The Salvation Army does not perform the sacraments. Um, they, they, they are a parachurch organization. Uh, they do good work. They're very helpful. Uh, but they miss some of the marks of the church, right? So parachurch organizations are not necessarily bad. This has been in debate for split Reformed denominations forever. But parachurch organizations are just groups of people that help uh, sometimes supplement or are extensions of. When I was at RUF, you know, technically RUF is sort of a part of the church, but is also a parachurch organization. That's the college minister of the PCA. So you're required to be a minister to have an RUF group at college campus, but we didn't administer the sacraments, and um, we didn't really have worship services. We, had, we called it large group, right? So somewhat a, an extension of a church, um, but not really the church, because there are three main marks of the church. And the first one, is, number one, true pre is the true preaching of the word. Now, what's the question? When you hear that, what's the question that might arise? True preaching of the Word. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't, when I'm on vacation, I usually like to go around and scope out and spy out other churches, and it helps me to remember. It helps me remember. Um, what is the true preaching of the Word? I mean, you're going to have disagreements. You're going to have disagreements, right? So... One of the things that uh, the Reformed Church has used and articulate is what's called the analogy of faith. Um, and this simply put, in the simplest of terms, simplest, is that Scripture interprets Scripture. And so a text or a sermon from a text can't mean what it didn't mean to the original hearers. And then there's application from that for us, because God word, God's Word, right? The whole counsel of God. But it can't mean what it didn't originally mean to its hearers. So Calvin, in his Institutes, he articulates two marks of the church, but he really included discipline, church discipline, in the proper observance of sacraments. So Calvin says, what are the marks of the church? True preaching of the Word and the right administration of sacraments. That's what he says. But then within the right administration of sacraments, there is an implicit discipline, church discipline. This is why we fence the table. This is why we want to protect people uh, when it comes to sacrament. This is why we don't allow everyone to hand out sacraments or, or um, administer the sacraments. The ministry of the word and sacraments is a perpetual mark and characteristic of the church. So Calvin says this. He says, that is to say that wherever that exists, meaning the word and sacraments, uh, entire and uncorrupted, no errors and, reg and, ir and irregularities of conduct form a sufficient reason for refusing the name of a church. So does this mean that preaching is perfect? Be honest. No. Um, Calvin allows for errors in preaching. 
so long as the grand doctrine of religion is not injured and the basic articles of faith are not suppressed. So, preachers, pastors are fallible human beings, sinful. Um, and there may be irregularities at times, or there may be mistakes. But that does not violate as long as the grand doctrine of religion is not injured. Some may call this the essentials of the faith. Some may call this the gospel. Some may say this the text. Um, also, when it comes to the sacraments, irregularities in the administration of the sacraments do not destroy the church or provide um, the legitimate institution, given that the legitimate institution that our author is not abolished or subverted. So, we do, look, we do sacraments different than other churches, right? Mode is a great example, okay? So, you've been in a non-denominational Baptistic church, the mode of baptism is different, right? Um, immersion. Um, and, but, and, and we've done that. We can do that as long as there's a service because the sacrament is always attached to the Word. Um, we also use effusion, which is uh, pouring, right? That's the theological term for pouring. Or sprinkling. We can do that. The mode is not the point. Um, it's the administration or what's behind that, and is it attached to the Word of God? There can be mess-ups, there can be differences of modes, there can be mistakes, but the sacraments must point back to the Word of God, God's revelation to us. This is the mark of the church. So pre true preaching of the Word, right administration of sacraments, Here's something else. A preacher proclaiming the gospel on a street corner does not constitute a church. Um, that's an extension of the church. That's evangelism. But in and of itself, that's not the church. Calvin says that the gospel must be heard and heeded as well as proclaimed for there to be a church. There must be a community of believers showing the root of faith and the fruit of love. So it's important to have a community, this community of faith. The characteristics of a true church are evidenced in passages such as, I'll just give you a few here. I, I think I put them in your handout. John 8, 31, also verse 32, verse 47. John 14, 23, 1 John 4, 1 through 3, 2 John 9, lots of John there. A church may be comparatively impure in its presentation of the truth, but it must, to be a church, must be focused around Scripture. The essentials, the meaning, um, the text as God's revelation. In the Reformed Church, we use, so here, here's an inside baseball. The Reformed Church, we use what's called historical redemptive hermeneutic. What that means is, that we, that the analogy of faith, that Scripture interprets Scripture, is that we want to take the Scripture so seriously that we understand that there's a story and that the entire story points to Christ. All of it. He's the culmination of history. His story. The culmination. All of it points to Christ. And so what that means for us is that you, sh that you would or should hear us Seeing Christ in all of Scripture. Scripture is about the Gospel. So I've given you basically six elements of that real quick, uh, just for your fun facts. Uh, Richard Gaffin, he's a Reformed uh, scholar. He's great. These are six elements of the approach of what does it mean for the true preaching of the Word? So here, here's some. Uh, distinct from, but not always within the context of his self-revelation and creation and history, God's special revelation has two basic modes. Deed revelation and word revelation. So, no, you're going to see revelation a lot when it comes to the preach, the, I, would, I would say the right preaching of the word. Um, redemption and revelation is historical. But again, it's all leading up to Jesus. and It's all looking back to Jesus. and It's all found in Jesus. Jesus in his person and work, number three, 
All of Scripture, the right preaching of the Word, should be centered on His death and resurrection as the culmination of His story, of this history of redemption. Number four, the subject matter of Revelation is redemption. That's why we need the Gospel. If, if I preach without the Gospel or without Christ, um, we may not get, we just might as well not gather. You can pull anything else up on YouTube. We need this. And, and by the way, preaching is an event. It's an event. This is why it's not enough just to watch a sermon on TV. It's an event that happens in real time and space with the people of God. Scripture Number five, Scripture is itself a revelation, not somehow less than revelation. Number six, to focus the preceding points hermeneutically, that just means interpretation of Scripture, as revelation is the interpretation of redemption, so the interpretation of Scripture is always derivative, the interpretation of term. That's wordy. That's wordy. I think, I think what he's saying here is that there, there's an interpretation of Scripture and the, and the sermon is the interpretation of the interpretation of Scripture or of Scripture. So just cross out six. We'll go on. Number two, the right administration of sacraments. Uh, we talked about the mode. Uh, for example, baptism is given to believers and their children, um, but some don't give it to their children, right? Uh, but baptism in and of itself is a mark of the church. So this is why I wrote this up here earlier. Typically in a baptistic church, you're not going to find this um, you know, visible and invisible church articulation. It's really going to be the visible church is the invisible church rather than the overlap. My little um, sophisticated diagram there. They are to be administered um, within the church. The sacraments are not to be administered. You're not, we're not supposed to be baptizing our grandkids in bathtubs. Okay? We, the, the, it is to be administered in the church. Um, Number three, for sake of time, church discipline is also a mark of the church. Uh, and is it essential for maintaining the peace and purity, there's the key, of doctrine and for guarding the holiness of the sacraments? Scripture is replete with discipline within the church. Uh, and it is not fun, and it is exhausting often, um, but it is accountability, and it is needed, and it is, it is a mark of the church. Reformers thought it was a mark of the church. Okay, questions? I'm going to stop there. Yeah. Questions? Responses? Yes, sir, Mr. Frank? Uh, so we have lots of different churches, if you will, that have They won't have a church membership, so they don't do that. I guess the reformers would say that's not a true church. If they're not doing, if they're not using the sacraments? Uh, yes. That's the way I read them. Thanks. Thanks for not bringing that until after the question because that's not an easy one. Uh, yeah, so um, I think that it, I'm going to give you my opinion on that. I, um, that may not be. Uh, can you repeat the question? Well, what I was talking about, with, you know, in terms of multiplicity of churches that we have in yeah. this country. And I specifically kind of drilled down into the Baptist church. You know, reformers wouldn't agree that they rightly administer baptism, one of the sacraments, but they do administer mm -hmm. the sacrament of baptism. So are, is that a true church? 
Yeah, so the answer, I think, is yes. It is true, church. And here's why. This is what I would say. Um, right administration of the sacrament is not just about mode. Um, so right administrat- administration of the sacrament is, number one, first and foremost, Trinitarian. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? It's a great commission, Matthew 28. Um, Secondly, um, there are different views, of course, on the sacrament. Like, you know, we've talked about these in here. You know, you, you have a uh, spiritual presence view, right? This is a reform view. You have, you have uh, the Lutheran view, which is um, consubstantiation. You have Catholic view, transubstantiation. Um, but ultimately, the reformers always said that the sacrament is a mystery. And so... Um, I think that there can be disagreements on the substance of the doctrine of those components of the sacrament, if this makes sense, I hope it does, Um, and still acknowledge that it is a mystery, and that would be a right administration of the sacrament. That's the way I would answer that. So number one, Trinitarian formula, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, some would argue needs to be by a minister. Um, I would say yes, but... I think that that's a debatable conversation, but um, I would not say I, I can't say that um, based on scripture that just because someone doesn't baptize their children, but then does that, then does baptize them when they come to faith, that that is a complete and utter violation of the right administration of the sacrament. I disagree with it, but I don't think it hits at the the foundation of the right administration of the sacrament. Um, it's, for one, we, we do that. So it's still a valid, right? I mean, I want my kids to be in the covenant community, in the covenant family. I want them to be members of the church. But we still baptize um, those who come to faith at an older age. So I don't, I don't know if that's helpful. I don't know if that... No, it's not? Okay. I'm not sure Calvin would have agreed, but... But sure. he's not infallible either. So. No, he's not. He's wrong about a couple things. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, can, can I say one thing about that? So, that last comment. You know, Calvin and Luther, they're baptized in the Catholic Church um, as infants. But they don't advocate rebaptism. They're They're baptized... They're particip- had participated in sacraments when they had a completely different view than the Catholic Church, but they don't advocate to rebaptize like the Anabaptists. So I don't know if that might be helpful too. So they, they, they saw a, a, a continuation even though there was a problem with. Uh, and it, this is a debate in the PCA, by the way. Do we rebaptize those who've been baptized in the Catholic Church? Um, I would say no. I would say no. You've been an elder, you know. You can teach next week, Frank. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, with Thanks regard for that. to that, uh, it reminded me of something that Luther had said. You know, that it, with regard to rebaptizing those who came out of the Roman Catholic Church, yeah. that uh, he said that it doesn't matter if they were baptized by Satan himself, as long as they're baptized in the name of the Triune God. I don't know about that. You're throwing crazy <laughs> stuff in <laughs> yeah. now, Sean. That's Luther, you know. Yeah. But, I don't know how much I had to drink before he made that statement. <laughs> Put that down. Uh, but actually, my question was about it was about the preaching of the word as a mark of the church. Um, I, and I was thinking about the the charismatic Pentecostals, whose focus is not on Christ and preaching; it's on the Holy Spirit and you know being empowered to live a victorious Christian life. And that's the focus of the the messages there. Does would that in itself? Uh, disqualify them for being a true church since Christ and him crucified is not the focus of the preaching. Yes, yeah, so I mean there's some subjectivity there. It's kind of, you know, generalization depends on what's said or, you know, if there's is there a continua- continual like you know, some charismatic I'd say Pentecostal theology is 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 um like oneness Pentecostalism, right? Is is um heretical. And I would not consider oneness Pentecostals. I'm just going to tell you, I may get in trouble. I, don't, I would not consider them a church because they've violated the uh, church's historic doctrine on the Trinity. Um, 
So I think it would be, you, you kind of have to look at, you know, what's the continua, continual message. I don't know. I got one more quick, quick question. I got to, I got to go. Thanks. And if anybody else has an answer, guys. <laughs> when going to, say, a Roman Catholic wedding or something and oh, no. you're offered, you know it's coming, the Lord's Supper or their communion, the Mass, what do, what do we do? Where's Mike? <laughs> uh, so I don't participate right. because um, cause the Mass is meant to be a sacrifice of Christ, which is, in my opinion, idolatry. So that's, my, that's what I, I would not participate. Uh, does that mean that there aren't Christians in the Roman Catholic Church? I think there are. I think there are Christians in the Roman Catholic Church because God often works despite, not because of. Right? So, and He's sovereign and He elects. So I'm not, I don't want to sound, you know, Yeah, I just um, bashing. I mean, that's, that's been my, that's what I've done for years, we had some, we had some dear, dear friends who were very, very Roman Catholic, we like to say. Yeah. And I visited with them. I was staying a weekend with them. was going to go to church. And the night before, we went over what was going to be happening, what it all meant. And, you know, here's the missal. Here it is in Latin. Here it is in English. And then he got to the part of uh, communion. And he said, oh, by the way, you're not going to get in trouble for coming to church with us, are you? And I said, no. He mm. said, I said, but I won't take communion. He said, oh, that's okay. We wouldn't give it to you. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. They're not going to give it to you anyway, so you don't have to worry about it. That's right. I tried one time when I was a teenager. A priest kicked me out. I didn't know what I was doing. Let me pray for us. Thanks. Father, we ask um, that you would use your word, God, and, and just uh, understanding of your church to continue um, our sanctification, Father, that we would grow in holiness as being your church, as your church, um, the church that you have sanctified, and that we would continually wash one another with your word uh, as we grow into the head who is our older, elder brother and King, Christ Jesus. And we pray all of this for His sake and in His name and to His glory. Amen.